Uh, thanks for all that instruction. There is a big uh, afternoon ahead of us uh, in preparation for our lobbying tomorrow. And I think you're going to uh, find uh, this next keynote by Jose Was uh, deeply inspiring and informative. And I know that the training that Jim Kaysen and Shoshana Abrams is leading is going to be really powerful. So, and as well as you're uh, breaking into to smaller groups and working with uh, some of the staff here at FCNL and preparing for your lobby visits. So thanks for joining us. Uh, before I uh, talk a little bit about Jose and about this work, I want to just remind all of you, those of you who've been with us for the last couple of days, and to inform those of you who are just joining us now, that um, in addition to setting a goal for how many people we could get to come lobby with us on the Justice and Policing Act, we set ourselves a goal for finding new people who would be willing to become sustainers of FCNL. Sustainers are people who give monthly gifts, and this um, type of giving is so valuable for our ongoing sustainability of FCNL. So if you are interested in being one of the sustainers, we're trying to have 25 new sustainers during this annual meeting, I hope you will consider signing up before tomorrow's end of the day so we can reach our goal. We currently have 11 people who have signed up, so uh, please help us meet that goal if you can. So one of the things that I think is really rich about uh, our work, and if you have done any lobby training with us, you know that we talk consistently about building relationships with members of Congress. Why do we do this? We do it because we believe it is essential for us to exercise our civic responsibility for tracking and caring what happens as well as for engaging in civil conversation with people who we disagree with and for encouraging those who we might agree with to take greater leadership. And you're gonna find out more about how to do that on this issue of justice and policing. The work that we do uh, here as we, we as Quakers often talk about this work as uh, seeing that of God in every person. And sometimes we talk about recognizing the dignity of every person, what, what Representative Holland talked about. Clearly, the Justice and Policing Act is aiming to do that through some specific federal changes that Jose will inform you on. What's important to know is that this work is not just about what's happening this week, but this work will need to go on next year as well. It's unlikely that we'll see the Senate act on this legislation before the end of 2020, and this will be part of the advocacy that FCNL does in 2021. Your commitment to talking to your representatives and senators to let them know that you care about this, that they have constituents who expect them to take action is just incredibly important. And to tell you how relevant and important your lobbying will be, I'm going to now turn this over to Jose Santos Was, who is our lead lobbyist for justice reform and election integrity. Now, some of you know Jose already because he has worked on worked with FCNL for a number of years now and has been the lead lobbyist for our work on mass incarceration as well. Jose has a heart uh, very much for addressing the, the, the challenges of over incarceration and for what happens to people when they are no longer incarcerated and what opportunities they have. He also has a heart for addressing the over-militarized policing and the, the um, devastating uh, ways that we have allowed policing to uh, become uh, unjust. Jose plays a leading role in the interfaith criminal to the Faithful Democracy Coalition. He also spends a lot of time lobbying. He visits many, many congressional offices, meeting with staff, <laughs> analyzing the politics of these issues, and figuring out how to get policy reform work done. Jose is going to speak for a few minutes, and then he's going to be joined by the program assistant for this program, Cameron Point, for a discussion about specific aspects of the legislation. on Tuesday. This information can prepare you as you get ready to go into congressional offices. And remember, if you have questions, please post them in the comments on YouTube. And as Annie said, come to the office hours this afternoon uh, uh, to find out a little bit more. So Jose Was, thank you for your leadership at FCNL and for joining us to Remark Now.
Implicit bias, racism, and its manifestations in, in violent policing violates the central truth. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was murdered after eight minutes and 15 seconds under the knee of Derek, under the knee of Officer Derek Chauvin, as three other officers stood by and watched. They did nothing. Nothing. As George Floyd slowly felt his life slipping away, he repeated, I can't breathe, and cried out for his mother. The other officers just watched on as a man was killed. It's easy to write off George Floyd's murder as an isolated incident. It is harder to take a long, hard look at our policing system in the US as a whole. This was not simply the action of one bad actor. George Floyd's murder is a result of our current policing system that allows officers like Derek Chauvin to harm black and brown lives without meaningful, reper re without meaningful repercussions. Those who decry violent protesters in the same breath as they condemn George Floyd's murder seek to discredit a movement for justice. They also want this to be a case of an isolated incident that affords the system to seem righteous and just. But we are sick and tired of these isolated incidents. These are black lives being taken from us. This should be above politics. It's life and death. Now imagine sleeping in your bed. Your boyfriend is shocked to hear the door ripped open. He fires his gun in self-defense to protect his home. The people who just broke in start firing indiscriminately looking for drugs. They make their way to the bedroom and a still sleeping Breonna Taylor is shot and succumbs to her injuries. She dies. These people are police officers sworn to protect Instead, they've murdered a young woman at the prime of her life. A public servant herself, she was an emergency medical technician, and a good one at that. Black people are more often seen as criminal, and we have a carceral state around us created by the war on drugs and harsh sentencing policies. These laws create a structure that is institutional racism in our policing. We know that policing is rife with institutional racism. The hashtags and tragedies have proven that to us. Policing involves so many decision points and officers they exercise discretion. Who to pull over? What house to search with a search warrant? What house to search with probable cause? When to feel that a threat is present? When to try and subdue a suspect with a chokehold? When they deem that force is necessary? When to point their gun? These tragedies are justified after the fact by switching on these decision points to justify the outcome. It's true that some officers may feel that they are perfectly justified after pulling the trigger. They may not see that implicit bias and racism in their actions. It's our job to make these truths known. Police officers are often shielded from accountability. The system is rigged with structures that prevent accountability by the police. For example, policies that allow for a cooling off period after an officer shoots someone before an, before an investigation can begin to help the officer prepare their defense. Laws are in place advocated aggressively by police unions to favor the police officer throughout the course of an investigation. District attorneys are reticent to act in bringing cases against an officer who with whom they probably worked to solve cases. That same favor and consideration isn't given to victims of police violence. They don't get the dignity or safety that the officer enjoys. Once a tragic act is complete, the officer often doesn't face accountability for his or her actions and his livelihood is intact. He continues to be a police officer with little change in his life but a life has been lost. It's important to note that being an officer has never been safer. Attacks against police have dropped to all time lows for decades. This is an issue of racial justice. We have struggled against, against state violence, 
against people of color for decades. The murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd can be traced back to the racist riots and violence in the prosperous black neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. Greenwood was a profitable black neighborhood that was ravaged by a racist mob. Their deaths can also be linked to Mayor Wilson Good giving the order to police to drop a bomb on a, Phil on a Philadelphia city block in 1985. Their deaths, the ultimate tragedy of systemic containment, which was seen in the decades of redlining that made black neighborhoods less desirable. Racism exists throughout the US society. It's intertwined. The police are actors in these racist structures and often carry out state violence against black and brown people. There's so many things we need done to make the system of policing more fair and just. A good number of those things can only be done by the city councils and state legislatures that oversee the 18,000 different police departments. There is, however, a role for the federal government to play. Using existing federal funds that police departments count on, we can enact change at the federal level that would apply at the state and local level as well. The Justice and Policing Act is the first ever bold, comprehensive approach to hold police accountable and racial profiling, change the culture of law enforcement, empower our communities, and build trust between law enforcement and our communities by addressing systemic racism and bias to help save lives. We at SCNL continue to urge Congress to turn the Justice and Policing Act into law. We've been in nearly 100 offices to push for policing reform, but we can't do it alone. As constituents, your voice is key to getting the Justice and Policing Act across the finish line. If officers don't hear from you, this may not move in the 117th Congress. Making this a top priority for Congress next year is our key goal. We need your voices to make this issue a top priority next year. We don't expect that this will pass this year. So thank you for your efforts and advocacy. Now I want to invite my colleague, Cameron Point, who is our program assistant for justice reform issues, to join me for a discussion of some of the kinds of questions we hear when, when the two of us go into congressional offices. We hope these questions will help you as you prepare for your lobby visit. Thank you, Jose, for those powerful words. I'm so grateful we're going to discuss an issue so important to us. Friends, please remember that you can find more information, including the main points we're highlighting in the Justice and Policing Act at fcnl.org slash QPPI. I'd like to start our discussion today, Jose, by talking about why national policing reform is necessary. Aren't these local issues Shouldn't we be leaving policing reform up to state and local governments rather than the federal government? Thanks for that question, Cameron. We hear that federalism question often when we lobby congressional offices. The reality is that we need a strong, united national response to the ongoing crisis of police brutality. Black and brown people all over the nation are dying at the hands of police every single day. We cannot afford to wait for the, for the over 18,000 police jurisdictions in this country to implement changes. Therefore, police from Maine to California must be held to the same standard of practice and accountability. Wow, I can only imagine how long it would take for 18,000 separate police jurisdictions to make their own comprehensive reform. And even if they did, I assume all those reforms wouldn't be equitable as they would differ town to town and state to state. So Jose, we know that racial profiling is one of the main concerns surrounding our American policing system. How does the Justice and Policing Act address unconscious or conscious racial biases police officers have? You're right, Cameron. Whether or not officers know it, racial bias can affect what decision officers make regarding people of color. 
The Justice and Policing Act mandates training on racial, religious, and discriminatory profiling for all local, state, and national law enforcement agencies. It creates a nationwide police misconduct registry to prevent problematic officers who are fired or leave one agency from moving to another jurisdiction without any accountability. The Justice and Policing Act also requires state and local law enforcement agencies to report use of force data by race, sex, disability, religion, and age. George Floyd was in a chokehold for over eight minutes after repeatedly saying, I can't breathe. Breonna Taylor was shot in her bed after officers entered her apartment with a no knock warrant. Jose, does the Justice and Policing Act say anything about chokeholds and no knock warrants? So I also wanted to add that Attorney General Cameron in Kentucky brought charges against one of the officers in the Breonna Taylor case for shooting at a neighbor's property, not for killing Breonna Taylor. So I just wanted to make that known because um, that wasn't videotaped and that is said to have contributed to those weak charges that didn't even take Breonna Taylor's life into account. And I'll say to your question, Cameron, these practices give police officers the power to decide life and death to literal accountability. The Justice and Policing Act bans chokehold and no-knock warrants like we saw in the Breonna Taylor case at the federal level. Funding for state and local law enforcement is conditioned based on their banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants as well. That's a good point, Jose. Officers get to choose life or death and when it comes to Black Americans, we disproportionately see the latter as the outcome. So then, overall, what does the Justice and Policing Act do to limit police violence? The Justice and Policing Act requires that deadly force be used only as a last resort and mandates officers to employ the escalation techniques first. The standard for use of force will be changed from reasonable to necessary. I see the language of reasonable versus necessary is extremely important when it comes to accountability, especially in use of force incidences. Speaking of accountability, I wonder what are some more ways that the Justice and Policing Act builds more accountability of police officers? The Justice and Policing Act requires federal, uh, federal uniform police officers to wear body cameras and requires state and local law enforcement to use existing federal funds to ensure the use of body cameras. Under the Justice and Policing Act, marked federal police vehicles would be required to have dashboard cameras. The statute 18 U.S.C. 242 describes when an officer deprives someone of their rights under color of law or in their official capacity. In the JPA, the threshold for bringing a case under the statute is changed from willfulness to recklessness to permit for more successful cases. This would permit for more recourse in the court against the police brutality. So I've heard that police officers can't be sued in civil court. Is that true, Jose? You're referring to a legal doctrine called qualified immunity. It shields and permits law enforcement to violate people's constitutional rights with virtual impunity. The Justice and Policing Act makes it easier to prosecute offending officers by amending the legal doctrine to allow for more prosecutions for police misconduct. By reforming qualified immunity for law enforcement, individuals can recover damages in civil court. To put it simply, as it currently stands in order to avoid frivolous lawsuits, law enforcement are granted qualified immunity from court action. This has been interpreted in an overly broad manner. It's complicated, but here's how it works in order to move a case forward and overcome qualified immunity. There must be another case where the conduct and circumstances are virtually identical, where the officer was found to have, to have acted illegally. If you can't find clearly established precedent, then your case doesn't move forward. 
no man or woman should be above the law, regardless of whether or not they wear a uniform. Wow, I didn't know that qualified immunity was basically a legal hall pass for officers to do whatever they want. It's encouraging to see the Justice and Policing Act changing provisions to make officers accountable to the law just as us everyday citizens are. And now I wanna switch our focus to the militarization of police officers. I've noticed more and more police officers with military grade equipment on American streets. How is that possible, Jose? And would the Justice and Policing Act do anything about it? You probably notice that police and protests are suited up as if they are going to war. Programs such as the Department, just such as the Department of Defense 1033 program fuel the militarization of law enforcement by arming local and state police like soldiers. The Justice and Policing Act limits the transfer of military grade equipment to state and local law enforcement. A sheriff's department in New Hampshire should not be equipped like soldiers. Yeah, personally, when I see guns and tanks of that caliber on the streets, I don't feel safer. I'm actually more afraid. The imbalance of power over citizens' lives is chilling. So what role do us everyday people have in the Justice and Policing Act? For far too long, police officers have been given the most power in overseeing public safety. The Justice and Policing Act establishes grants for community-based organizations to create local commissions and task forces to help communities to reimagine and develop concrete, just, and equitable public safety approaches. Thank you. And of course, today we are really wanting to prepare you our FCNL network to go into congressional offices and make sure that the Justice League Act is a priority. I just want to remind friends that all this information is available at fcnl.org slash QPPI. So Jose, uh, let's just help people specifically get set up so they can plan their visits to congressional offices. For example, if your senator already co-sponsored or voted for the bill, what more do you want the office to do? I will start off with a big thank you for their support. Let your senator representative know that we appreciate the momentum and need it going into the next Congress. Encourage them to prioritize supporting the Justice and Policing Act in 2021. But my sense is people may be feeling like Congress will not pass this bill this year. Realistically, what is Congress going to do this year? And why is it for important for us to lobby now, Jose? Our call for an end to police brutality cannot and will not end with 2020. With our passion and momentum, we are setting up the Justice and Policing Act to be passed in 2021. We need to lobby now in order to show Congress that police reform still remains a top priority. That's why you're here two weeks after the election. We need you to stress how important it is that we pass meaningful legislation to bring just and accountability into communities, especially black and brown communities across this country. We've been on the Hill pushing this bill and will continue to be on the Hill to advocate for this bill. The Justice and Policing Act will not pass without this pressure. And that's why we're so thankful for you adding your voice to these efforts. And since the Justice and Policing Act passed in the House, but not the Senate, one question that friends may have is what we should be saying to Republican lawmakers to get them to pass it this time. For instance, if you're in Iowa lobbying Senator Chuck Grassley, what would you say to him? Again, it's always great to start with thank you. For example, Senator Chuck Grassley was a champion of the First Step Act, a federal criminal justice reform bill that began to address the harsh prison sentences that have left so many people, particularly so many black people incarcerated. Thank the Senator for these efforts and let him know that we are, that we see addressing police violence as a next step in this effort to address 
racial injustice in our society. Looking at the four components of the Justice and Policing Act, does Senator Grassley support federal legislation to address those four key issues? We would love to work with, with the Senator to pass legislation that encompasses these four points. Cameron, I know you know how important this is. We must work to fix racist policing policies that allow the targeting and brutalizing of black and brown people. We must re-examine the role of police in our nation's framework. Black people cannot and will not feel safe in, in our nation until our justice system views and treats us as fully human with the complete dignity and respect given to all others. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this important conversation. This legislation is truly a powerful first step to address the violence black and brown people face at the hands of the police daily. We don't expect you to remember everything we discussed today, but remember the power of your story as a constituent is what is most important. 600 people will be in congressional offices saying Congress needs to pass legislation to address police reform. Your voices now in these offices saying we want justice and policing to pass quickly are the most vital part of this process. Now we're gonna take some questions from friends. Annie, can you tell us if we have any questions from the chat? Far more questions than we will have time to answer right here, but I do wanna remind everyone that if we did not get to your question today, we definitely encourage you to join us at 6.30 Eastern for office hours with Cameron, Jose, um, and a couple of other folks from our legislative team. So thank you so much for all these wonderful questions. Um, our first question is from John Dykus. He asks, what are the opposing arguments we may confront? So the opposing arguments are, we need to make sure that police have everything that they need to do their job to keep us safe. Uh, this is a thinking that um, prioritizes police in safety, which we know isn't the case. Uh, c communities keep us safe. Um, it's not so, It's not a person with a gun that is the key to keeping us safe. Um, we need to remember that the root causes of crime are, are things like mental mental, mental illness, um, poverty. Uh, lack of a job, um, drug addictions. And if we address those issues head on, we can keep our community safer, not just with police. Also, um, a lot of Republicans will say that we can't pass something as broad as the Justice and Policing Act because we can't be usur the federal government can't be usurping um, the state's and local government's natural role, which is to oversee police. So those are the main uh, points of pushback that you'll find in offices. And that's super helpful. Thank you, Jose. Oh, and Cameron, did you want to add something? I did just want to add to the last point Jose brought up, the federalism argument we tend to hear when we visit um, offices, especially in the Senate. I mean, just remind um, those offices that there are 18,000 police jurisdictions in the United States. We need some reform in order for it to be equitable. Um, we cannot wait for each individual police jurisdiction to make their own comprehensive reform. And that's why the Justice and Policing Act is so necessary. That's super helpful. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Elizabeth Carden, Kasdan sorry, asks, in yesterday's policy debate, meaning during the meeting for business with our general committee, there was a push for defunding slash abolishing, abolishing police rather than reform. Can you discuss FCNL's thinking about how these bills interact with the calls to quote defund or abolish? So thank you for that question. That's a very important movement that's happening actively at the state and local level, uh, promoted by um, movements, uh, that have been instituted and energized by Black Lives Matter, Black Youth Project 100. Um, so really from the grassroots. We need to remember that 
about 95 to 97 percent of the funding that police receive are from local and state government and that's why that movement will continue at the state and local level in terms of federal funds that makes up about three to five percent of what law enforcement receives and it's more effective to try to encourage change with those funds to put strings on those funds and say you must be more just and equitable across the country um and that's why our our reform efforts are more so reform efforts than they are defund efforts because um it's much more fruitful to try to seek changes using the existing federal funds that are there great cameron was there anything you wanted to add i think that jose covered it perfectly wonderful the next question is from deborah fink george floyd's murder demonstrates that local police aren't necessarily following the law is it possible to deny federal funding when local police departments do not enforce the law and similarly, there was also a question about where oversight of police departments play into this law. So that's a great question. There's a movement to um, enforce a particular section of the Civil Rights Act that says agencies that violate the civil rights of, of uh, US citizens should not receive federal funds. That, that hasn't been... Um, that hasn't been followed. And there's a push to encourage the federal government to follow this section of the Civil Rights Act. <clears throat> and we might see that with the new administration. Um, in terms of accountability, I think a lot of this, a lot of the Justice Policing Act um, institutes requirements on local and state law enforcement that they act in certain ways to receive federal funds. Certain ways such as like we mentioned with um, the use of force standard being a necessary standard and that the escalation techniques must be used, for instance. So the disbursement of federal funds is conditioned on making changes that are in the Justice Policing Act. That's how we institute more accountability in police through this legislation. Wonderful. And I think for just our last question here, we have from John Loden Camper. Does the police demilitarization initiative include some retraining for those coming from the military to refocus from quote enemy to quote community? So that's a good question, but I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of what the federal government can do. Um, there's training that happens at the local level, and that would be a good item to consider at the state and local level. Um, I'm not sure that the federal government can take that on. That makes sense. And Cameron, was there any closing remarks that you wanted to make before I turn it back over to Jose? Um, no, just thank you for having this discussion with us. We really appreciate your engagement. Jose, I'd love for you to just leave us with some top line um, items that you'd like us to all remember as we head into offices. We don't know what's going to happen next year, but we do know that we do know is that if we don't make it, this a priority through your lobbying, we won't see the Justice and Policing Act move next year. It's important to stress, like Cameron said, there are eighteen thousand police jurisdictions in the country. We can't possibly wait for each and every one to make changes. People are dying now. The question of federalism is one that we can overcome. We've passed bold legislation that encompasses nationwide policies in the past. And we've done it using federal funds, which is the natural role of Congress to regulate federal funds and interstate commerce. It's clear that police operate very differently in white communities as opposed to black communities. And we know that tragedy disproportionately falls on black communities. Your persistence is so important in making these changes and moving to and moving us to real safety and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I think one of the things that really stuck with me is that 
our advocacy can't wait. And the work that we do now will lay the groundwork for future action. This is what persistent Quaker advocacy looks like.